Welcome to the Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtable on Innovative Interconnections, both for our guests here on site at Telecom Exchange NYC and for our viewers joining us on RCR TV and JSA TV. Our last panel of the day is entitled Innovative Interconnections and Their Impact on Business. The panel is moderated by my friend, Richard Lukic. More than 20 years of investment banking experience, Richard has originated, structured, executed hundreds of deals, totaling over 100 billion, that's with a B, of transaction value. Mr. Lukic is a founder of Bank Street and aspires with his partners to create a premier middle market investment banking franchise yep. focused on growth sectors of the global economy. Please welcome my friend Richard. So as I understand it, we're standing between everyone and their cocktails. <laughs> uh, we intend to make this as much fun. I was about to announce that uh, my uh, fellow panelists here uh, have uh, set the bar high because they intend to uh, provoke and uh, cause mischief here to make this the most enjoyable panel of the day. So uh, uh, with that being said, uh, uh, I'd like to maybe, uh, uh, first of all, thank everyone. And I was uh, commenting to uh, uh, the JSA team that uh, this event has actually continued to grow in its success, that it's fair to say that it has outgrown this room. But uh, <laughs> kudos to, uh, to all of you. Um, I might ask every one of the panelists, many of whom are well known to the crowd here, to spend maybe a minute or two uh, introducing themselves and their organization as, as a kickoff um, on the, uh, uh, on the uh, dialogue here, and then we'll, uh, we'll start the, uh, the back and forth. And uh, I'd like to also, I guess, arrange for a question or two from the audience towards the end, even though I know we're, we're sort of running low on time because of the mischievous prior panel that uh, ate into our time here, but uh, we'll try to make up for it. We've got higher bandwidth on this panel. <laughs> so maybe we start with Richard and work our way down the, uh, uh, the aisle here. Sure. So I'm uh, Richard Steenberg, and I'm the CTO, one of the co-founders of Packet Fabric. Uh, Packet Fabric is a completely greenfield network designed around the purpose of 100% automation and making networking services more like a cloud. So kind of a complete rethinking of the way that we provide services, both transport, interconnection, um, everything in that space. Um, I'm Nazar Ahmad. I'm part of the network team at Facebook. Um, Somebody said um, the other day, you guys are working on everything deep sea to space. Anything in the middle network, we're working on. So um, building infrastructure to support uh, Facebook, um, serving the billions of users, I, I lose count on that stuff. But uh, essentially, pretty much any country in the world, we have users, so connectivity there. And then um, also, uh, Facebook as a mission wants to connect more people to the internet, so working on a lot of technology development on uh, broadband access side as well. Uh, Frank Ray, still working for a small software company in the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> and I uh, work on all of global network strategy and acquisition, um, building out our cloud services, supporting all of Microsoft's 200 online cloud properties. I'm Patrick Coughlin. I'm Chief Revenue Officer for First Light. Um, we were founded by uh, Bill Gates. Oh, I'm sorry, I was reading from your script. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're, fa <laughs> we're a facilities-based operator in New England and upstate New York. Uh, 9,600 route miles, 5,000 on net buildings. Um, I think what we're, our, our, we're known for is taking customers from Tier 2, Tier 3, Tier 4, and bringing them to tier one cities. Um, and we, we manage uh, both whole carrier wholesale and vertical markets. Um, we have network into Montreal and some of the things that we're doing hopefully will uh, assist some of the other players here in terms of diversity and uh, creating um, new opportunities across the board. Great. Uh, Gil Santoli, CEO and founder of NJFX. Um, had a company called Four Connection, sold it in 2008 to Cablevision. Worked on my golf game for a while, got a really good tan. And um, 2015, we had an idea. And the idea was, let's do something right. Let's build an interconnection facility where it's meant to go. Let's put it where the cables come across the ocean. Let's create an intersection point that's meant to do what it does in terms of building it right. So NGFX was founded. 
It was built inside originally the Tata Cable Landing Station, operating the Meet Me Room, carrier neutral style. And in 2016, last year, we opened our doors to the world's first tier three co-location facility at a cable landing station. Today, we've got 48 more acres and we're putting up buildings. We're allowing others to do what only a few in the past could do, and that is interconnect with subsea cables in a place that it's meant to be. And we've got seven new backhaul providers with multiple fiber cables giving optionality to all those subsea cables. So in essence, we're treating the subsea network the way it should have always been treated, with a proper building and plenty of capacity to leave. Thank you, Gil. So much has been said today about uh, these uh, pesky content and OTT folks who uh, uh, drive unit pricing down and, and uh, uh, are looking at uh, cost plus models as the basis for their uh, approach to the market. Um, maybe picking up on some of those themes, um, uh, I'd ask uh, Frank and Najam to uh, uh, comment on the, the evolution. I mean, I think we've seen also there is a difference between content players in terms of how they approach the marketplace. Uh, we've also seen uh, principal plays with capital for ownership versus participatory uh, syndicate uh, propositions. Uh, maybe comment a little bit about how you distinguish or differentiate your go-to-market strategy and maybe that uh, uh, is a way for us to uh, maybe hear from two of the leading players who have been uh, deploying capital in the space. Sure. Now you're in space now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Um, so the, um, our strategy is driven essentially by necessity. Um, if you think about the volumes and amounts of traffic that we're pushing out uh, of individual data centers, um, it's uh, not sort of engineering-wise even feasible to buy an elite capacity model because um, we're talking about turning up terabits every time that we turn up stuff. And uh, going through a ISP's um, deployment cycle, budget approval cycles, and all of that uh, for hardware is just impossible to do at our pace. Um, so our, our environment tends to be really volatile and crazy growth at times. And so we need that engineering flexibility, uh, and then we need the control to be able to turn up stuff on uh, in a moment's notice. So outside of any of the business needs, there's a, a engineering need to have a lot of flexibility, a lot of capacity, uh, and some control over uh, what we're deploying. Now, if you look at the financial side of things, um, uh, it's the same conversation that once you need that much capacity, it just makes no financial sense to actually try to buy an elite capacity model. Um, there's not a lot of value add uh, on top of that uh, that an ISP can provide. It actually slows us down in, in a lot of ways uh, to act, uh, have that lit capacity model. So we end up sort of doing the dark fiber. Uh, then the, the other engineering aspect for us is really that uh, we tend to take a lot more risks and push technology a little further. Um, and that cycle benefits us. Um, it's part of our fundamental design where um, if we can push the technology envelope and get a lot of excess capacity, that becomes our buffer against big spikes. And we get terabits or several terabit spikes uh, all the time. Uh, but it's also redundant because now we're building capacity that uh, is that designed to be redundant. And uh, the excess capacity, as I said, becomes our, our buffer in that. So we have an advantage to push technology far more uh, and take risks that a ISP may not be able to take because then they have other customers that can't, cannot tolerate that the failure rates. Uh, we can tolerate a lot more failure rates because our systems are designed that way. So there's like fundamental need for us to go uh, build path rather than buying uh, capacity. I'll let Frank at the rest. Yes, yeah, everything he just said. <laughs> <laughs> now, but we, we do face a lot of the similar issues uh, and that's why we've partnered in some areas. Uh, we're not a content player, we're not an OTT, we are a cloud provider and we're providing different services to the market. So. For us, a lot of the, the focus is around availability, reliability, resiliency, and that requires us to, to look at the world and the infrastructure in a slightly different way, and then we run into a lot of the issues that, that Najam and his team faces. Um, I think one of the things thing that differentiates us from a lot of the other players in our space and the other technology companies in our space 
is that the, the companies that we partner with in the market, they're also large customers of Microsoft, right? So there's a huge buy-sell relationship. So it, it, on the one hand, it, it creates its own challenges, but it opens up its other opportunities and um, it creates, you know, requires you to be a little bit more creative in how you go about and working with those companies and partnering with them and trying to establish uh, what your go-forward path is. Talk a little bit, before we leave the two of you, talk a little bit about where uh, your organization is determined to use the balance sheet versus consumption from the marketplace. Um, you, you mentioned that sometimes it's, it's traffic driven, but uh, there are also circumstances where it could be built by the balance sheet of a third party and you've opted to own the underlying asset, in other cases you've not. So uh, maybe a little bit of distinction on where, where you make that determination. Sure. Um, our, our default is if you can buy something, we'll buy it because it saves us time. Uh, engineering resources are precious. Uh, they are the most valuable commodity that we got. Um, so if you can buy something that makes sense, then we will definitely buy it. Uh, and if you don't feel like we can get what we want, then we have to go try to build it. That's sort of most of the time our decision criteria. Mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases, what we have seen, especially in the fiber world, is that uh, a, a particular uh, telco or ISP may have a business case that is just quite not there yet, just almost there, but not quite. And then what we can do is we can come help in and say, okay, we'll get the business case across the, the line for you. Right. You go build it and we'll, get, we'll take this much out of it, right? So we've done a bunch of those type of, of deals where we help a business case through the line and make that project happen. Often otherwise projects linger on for a long time just looking for the right amount of funding or the business case to happen. Uh, so those are really two criteria that we use. Uh, Frank, I think picking up on John's last comment, you, you've actually had some recent case studies as well uh, where you all were the enabler of uh, uh, Express and some other projects as well. Maybe talk a minute or two about determining that, determining to do that and, and uh, the approach you took in those instances and whether or not that's something you'll do again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... We were just talking with Jamie about that um, earlier today, right? I think I've been saying for a while now the the, the timelines, the, the development timelines and, and time to market um, cycle in today's digital economy continues to get faster and faster, but the timelines to develop the kind of infrastructure that we all collectively need, it's not really getting any faster. Right? Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's gotten a lot slower. So that becomes a real uh, key differentiator for us. Anywhere where we can help to try to accelerate what's being developed in the market, but there needs to be a market for it. Right? We're, if we're just gonna develop something that only Microsoft needs, then we have to question it. We have to do our own fiduciary responsibility question whether or not that's actually something that's gonna be of value because ultimately, you know, we're all either, you know, customers of the people that are here or of, of, of Najum's company, of my company. So, we all have to have a need for it, and if we don't, then we have to question of whether that's the right thing to do. That's right. Uh, Richard, maybe switching to you for a minute, uh, much has also been said today about uh, new infrastructure and uh, uh, the proliferation of uh, uh, additional mesh networks on the global stage. Y your business, along with a couple other players in your space, um, sort of is taking advantage of that in a way that's uh, uh, quite innovative and driving uh, the cost paradigm, particularly for content users, but also others as well. Maybe talk a little bit about how you're approaching the marketplace in a way, because it, it's sort of a nouveau uh, approach to the marketplace that, uh, that we're seeing more of. Yeah. So I, I think a real key differentiator between what we're trying to do and other people in the space, and by in the space, I think most people mean has a portal and an API and does some type of automation, is there's a lot of folks that are out there focused on connecting to public cloud, connecting to Amazon or Microsoft, and, and that's it has its place, right? There, there's a value there. But what we're looking at doing is making networking more like a cloud. So I know these bo both involve the words network and cloud, but they're very different concepts, right? Uh, we're looking at, in the same way that, you know, an Amazon kind of changed the model for how people use compute and storage by removing the need. You know, if you, you look historically, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that every Every single company needed to have their own infrastructure, have their own racks, have their own people to go out there and configure it. So now anyone anywhere can go to a website, put down a credit card and start spinning up cores. Why can't you do that in the, in the field of networking, right? So that's, we've really taken the approach of, of how do you virtualize the network and how do you make it consumable? 
And the other big aspect of this is, uh, you know, as much as technology advances on the transport side, it's still fundamentally limited at the interconnection side. Mm -hmm. So a, a Microsoft or a, a Facebook will push terabits of capacity. I don't think people realize how much capacity these content guys push, and probably content's not the right word, but uh, how much the, these guys push between one data center and another to make web scale services work. That is driving the economy. That's driving the, the scale. That's why uh, whenever I see people talk about uh, you know, there being a, a bottom of, uh, of price compression, I laugh, because that, these guys are, are absolutely driving that scale to make that work, but it stops at the point where their network ends, because now you've got to get to someone else's network, and now you've got to figure out where's the right place to be to do that, what's the right infrastructure look like to do that. It's no longer under their control, it's, it's someone else needs to do it. So our vision is kind of taking the technology that they've pioneered and turning it into not just connecting yourself to yourself, but connecting to a broader ecosystem and, and really making that bandwidth massive, easy to consume, very scalable, very quick. Hmm. And talk a little bit about how you use technology as well uh, to drive your unit pricing ability as well. Uh, yeah, so, so like I said, you know, we, we really focus on kind of leveraging the technologies that have been built for building these large data center networks. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of work going on in, uh, in just data center networking and the, the packet side, right, where you're able to now build these massive terabit capacity uh, devices that are very scalable. You're able to get the optic prices much, much lower by, by focusing on the volume that they've been using and the technology they've been using. Uh, technologies like EVPN uh, have, have come along to kind of enable these more scalable networks. Uh, DCI on the optical side, right, has really driven a, a large amount of business uh, where it's now very easy to turn up, you know, you know, today 200 gig waves and tomorrow 400 and by the end of the year 600 gig waves. Uh, that type of technology is really driving uh, the, the new evolution of a next generation network and then the, the real trick is how do you put software on that? How do you automate that? How do you make that virtualized? That's right. Exciting times in that space. Uh, maybe switching to Gil for a minute because he touched on uh, an element of the interconnection play that, that takes these uh, uh, hard network, uh, whether they're subsea or terrestrial in nature, uh, and aggregates them at a point where, where traffic is distributed all over the world in many cases. Um, maybe, Gil, talk a minute or two about uh, uh, what you see in this proliferation dynamic away from sort of the traditional uh, uh, core data center propositions to more of these interconnection rich type of platforms. And you're obviously addressing one of the corridors with uh, the largest density of, of, uh, of landing station uh, opportunities. But there are other places in the world as well that have some similar opportunities. Uh, tell us a little bit about what, you're, what you've learned uh, on the Jersey Shore that uh, uh, is something that we could see as a trend maybe on the world stage as we think about um, these kinds of opportunities. Sure. So over the last 18 months, we spent time traveling the globe, getting to meet all the international carriers within their countries and in the U.S. And you'd be amazed to find out that these international carriers believe their subsea cables land in New York City. We try to explain to them there are no cable landings in lower Manhattan, and they refuse to believe us. <laughs> but we finally had a few of these folks come and said, there's the cable. Walked into the cage. That's a wet cable. See what it looks like? We're in New Jersey, right? Here is US cables. They go to Ashburn. You can pick and choose how things work. So what we've really done is disrupted and educated the marketplace. We've made the world aware that New York City is not a place where cables actually land. It's a great city. We all love to travel and come here, but our network doesn't have to go through lower Manhattan. We don't have data centers left in New York City anymore. It's a great place to walk around, barely drive, but you know, a network really should consider the destination it's going to. So the interconnection point we created was a purpose-built facility that lets you pick and choose how you leave and come to the US. And if you want to travel between continents, in one building with one cross connect, we can connect you between Brazil and Europe, as well as the Caribbean. So we've got optionality for you that the market's never seen before. It's just really the next step in the evolution of interconnection. Agreed. And uh, I think we're seeing some of the themes that Gil just referenced in uh, other parts of the world as well, as we've been uh, active in, in uh, some additional geographies where you have uh, concentrations of, uh, of landing station capacity. Um, and terrestrial needs that actually need to access it, uh, I think there'll be more, more opportunities to talk about on the world if, stage. If I would add, you know, we have another location that's being developed at the moment. It's down in Virginia, Virginia mm -hmm. Beach, and they can do what we just did. 
they can try and put a data center right there and have a neutral facility connect between the Murray and the Brusa cable. And for the first time, you'll see that then, another yep. interconnection point. The only other one we ever had in the U.S. was called Napa the Americas. And everyone thought, including me, that Napa the Americas where the cable actually landed. But that's in Miami. The cables were landing in Boca, 50 miles north. So, again, we're just educating a marketplace on how things really work and making sure the awareness is there with the marketplace. Yeah, to add to his point, I mean, we really are not that innovative with our interconnections. Uh, we've done everything traditionally. You know, you come into a, uh, either a head end that someone developed or a carrier hotel, and then you're at the mercy of that carrier who owns that facility. And some of them are very restrictive in terms of, A, the cost of cross-connecting or the cost of even getting you in there. A lot of them just want to meet you somewhere and then they'll pull you in. Um, I think we need more, whether it's a Gills company or another company, we need more companies that are building true carrier neutral facilities. Because to me, if you're holding, you know, either uh, a Facebook or um, a Microsoft, um, you know, you know, with a ransom note that says it's going to cost you five thousand dollars a month to cross connect. I mean, that's not innovative, um, right. and it, it, I think it holds back some of the things we're trying to do. Because, you know, these guys are doing. You know, if they're hitting terabytes worth of information, they want to be able to quickly and seamlessly get rid of it and have it, you know, go around the world. I, I, I don't think we do that today. Um, it's something not, we need to strive. Not to take over your panel, but what, what happened recently My was <laughs> <laughs> now now. <laughs> There was, a, there was a fiber cut six months ago, and the cable was down hard for days. And the subsea provider said, hey, I need some help with the deal out with another subsea provider to transit over a bunch of traffic. It was going to take 200 cross connects to do it. The, the, the provider said, sure, that's going to cost you X amount of dollars per month for a three-year contract. I need it for like a day, two days. <laughs> In our model, we don't charge recurring fees. How can we help you? Let's do all these cross connects in the next 24 hours, get them done for you. So the industry needs carrier neutral. You're not doing predatory pricing on cross connecting people to each other. And that's what we're saying is get, let's get back to basics. The carriers need help, right? They need to work together. It's a collaborative industry. And they have to have a marketplace where making a dollar is not the most important thing. We've got a higher calling in this industry, right? We've got to, we've got to make this all work. Because well, these guys will just go out and build their own facility. If we make it prohibitive, <laughs> you could 5, do that. 5,000 and cross-connect? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> we just started a new business today, actually. <laughs> Free. I don't know why anybody would want to go to Virginia Beach anyway. It's crazy down there. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, you know, I'm just I'm listening. I was just listening to Gil. Maybe part of the innovation needs to, be, needs to be that we start using different terminology for what we're talking about because... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the buildings that we're talking about not charging cross connects, they're not really, they are already carrier neutral, but the problem is still the same. So maybe carrier neutral is not the word that we need to be using anymore. I don't know, that's just me. Yeah, no, I, look, and I think also uh, maybe a, a good segue to Richard again on uh, talking about virtualizing uh, a lot of this interconnect activity as well, because uh, the infrastructure layer is certainly a, a big part of it, but I think uh, uh, with uh, uh, a, a preponderance of uh, uh, innovation around the uh, virtualization of the entire function and the sharing of those interconnected uh, facilities, uh, it provides a whole new set of opportunities as well. Yeah, so it, I think if you look at the cycle of kind of the evolution of, of Kira Neutral Data Centers, what you see is there's a lot of places that come along and say, we want to be competitive, we want to give away cross connects for free, we just want to enable stuff, and the problem is no one's there. And it takes years, it takes a, a five year cycle, right, for, for really the economy of different carriers to all shift to this is the new place to be. And by the time that happens, they suddenly figure out, oh, this is a great revenue stream we need to monetize. And it goes up and up and up and up and up every little, every year. So the, the problem is that the interconnection itself is dependent upon being in a particular physical place, right? So you can, I, I can go start the best data center tomorrow and I can say interconnection is free. Why isn't everyone using it? Because it takes time and business and, and reasons to be there. So. Our, ask, our, our approach is to virtualize it. So we're providing the interconnection without being tied to a particular physical space. So the, the, the data center itself isn't necessary. You still need a data center somewhere, but the goal is to make it so that it's completely agnostic as to where you're at. 
it should be as simple as easy. You know, for, for people who are doing less than terabits, they probably don't need to be doing it themselves, right? And that's my definition of, of cloud and hyper-specialization is if we're able to do this and do it better and do it cheaper, more reliably than everyone else, if you're not doing the, these terabit scale connections, you probably don't need that physical infrastructure yourself. We're better able to virtualize that and then not be tied to that physical space. I want to come back to Pat for a second because when we uh, uh, saw him and his colleagues uh, uh, come into uh, First Light some years ago, the company was growing sort of at 50 to 100 percent a year, and that really was quite slow by their appetite and expectations. So they uh, it decided to inorganically uh, juice that, and uh, today have actually created one of the uh, most impressive platforms in the Northeast. Um, Pat, talk a little bit about the motivations uh, that uh, that have been behind your aggressive uh, assembly and, and organic growth in, in the Northeast, and how how you distinguish that from from an, an ordinary or organic approach that actually was performing quite well even before you started down this it, path. It's a great question. Um, scale means everything in this business. Um, Frank won't talk to me if I have a small network that really doesn't do anything for him. So, you know, where can it? it and that goes for the wireless carriers and not just picking on Frank because he's sitting next to me. But um, I'm used now, to John, now John might talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, you know, scale means everything to my customers. You know, being able to, um, in a much larger um, fabric, uh, solve problems for them. Whether it's cell tower backhaul, whether it's diversity, um, whether it's large enterprise customers looking for, you know. Um, Internet access, um, uh, again, you know, as a uh, bailiwick against the ILEC, um, those are all rationales for us um, expanding the footprint inorganically. And, you know, we can see it now. The conversations that we're in today, we would never have been in, a, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, and it's because of the scale and the size of the network. So um, we saw it as a great opportunity to you know, expand the footprint, but also now, you know, develop a little bit of an international flair. We, we go into Canada um, in two different fashions. We're actually working on a third um, that will offer some diversity out of Western New York. Uh, again, we couldn't do that if we didn't compile those assets, um, t you know, today. And eventually we hope to creep down, and I get a tan that's somewhat it's like Gil uh, in the future, um, but interconnect with him because, again, we believe that the more uh, points we touch, you know, the greater the opportunity field. Make sure Gil buys you a T-shirt at his golf club before uh, <laughs> some going to the lotion. facility. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to probably turn to the audience in a minute, but I guess as we sort of all look out, um, we, we chatted a little bit about this whole data center uh, infrastructure ecosystem, and we're starting to see an increasing uh, orientation towards uh, a, plur a plip proliferation of uh, more and smaller uh, sized facilities uh, closer to edge infrastructure. Uh, and that obviously has implications for how people connect to it and how, how it is utilized uh, both by content players as well as uh, those pushing data to the cloud. Um, obviously that also has a, a profound impact on networks and, and Pat I think touched on Scale, scale sometimes is also uh, importantly uh, in the fiber and broadband space, often determined by the, the the mesh of network density that you have in a particular geography. How do you each see your companies um, adjusting to this migration path, if you will? And it's not to suggest, by the way, that it's away from uh, or predominantly away from core facilities. I feel like to some degree, the edge facilities are doing something incremental uh, in, in a large measure. But, but I'd like to hear each of your own thoughts about how you see that proliferation affecting your business. Starting with you, Richard. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're right. They do very different things, right? So the edge facilities are there to distribute content to the internet or things like that. And they're very different from the centralized compute where what you care about is low cost power uh, and, and scalability of, of infrastructure. So very different things, but at the same time, you still need to think about interconnection as you start to do these edge facilities. You know, a facility that's close to the customers is no good if the customers can't connect to it, can't get to it. And the problem is as we add more and more and more locations, you know, it, it used to be, it's really simple if you think about New York and you think there's only one place to go. If I go to 60 Hudson, I've got everything I need. Well, that's not true. That doesn't work that way. And it definitely doesn't work that way as you start to go to these more edge facilities and you try to figure out where is that critical mass. 
And that's where I think there's a role for, like, like I said, virtualizing the network piece of it is not to be tied to that particular physical space, but to be tied to how does that space interconnect with other networks? How does that, is there a location that it does make sense for people to start to put their, their edge content? Uh, but you, you still, you need innovative ways to interconnect the backbone network, the, the users that get there, and it's, it's something that hasn't really been tackled before. Uh, that's, that's, I think, uh, one of the challenges we, we all need to address if we're going to make that type of model work better. Michelle? Okay, I think I'm going to try and say what Raz said in different words. Um, <laughs> um, law of physics you can't change. Um, that's, you know, physics is absolute. Uh, buildings run out, doesn't matter what you do. Um, and if all of us want to be in business, they better run out of capacity. That's a good thing. That means the internet's growing, the network's growing, we're all using it. So get with it, it's okay. Building's running out of space. Um, so to Raz's point, if you're tied to a building and you have to be in one building, then it's just not gonna scale, you're never gonna grow up, you're never gonna be big. So if you wanna be big, build those abstraction layers, get away from the physical constraints of anything. As I said, you can't change the physics of things. So. Um, figure out abstractions that you can actually not worry about where you physically are, worry about what connectivity you need and do that. Um, and to my carrier partners, entirely, even sort of in this, this conversation, it's entirely too much about cost. Um, I would argue that if you make it a lot easier for somebody to use it, you will have more customers. I will show you this. We all go pay 800 bucks and get in line to buy this thing. <laughs> Seriously, it's not worth 800 bucks, but we do. Because it's, it's fun to use, it's easy to use, and you get there. Um, make interconnects that way that if your network is growing, that you can actually um, point and click and build the network on a heartbeat and kind of move on and serve your business. So instead of having to worry about focusing building network, you're focusing building your business and the network can go. So the carrier partners have to kind of think about that is instead of worrying about the cost of, hey, what the cross connect I can charge, what I can do with it, it's making it so easy and so usable that a four year old can get take this and run videos on it in 10 minutes. And you don't have to have a manual for it. Can you make the carrier interconnects that way? Uh, that's sort of what it takes, and that's sort of the Raz's point as well, is that you don't really care about where connectivity is or where physically you are as long as you, you do the connectivity. The rest of the stuff, um, the scale folks will figure out, you know, a lot of other things because, you know, we, we're putting uh, 100 racks at our edge. We obviously can't put it in 60 huts and so we have to split it out and build different buildings and all of that, and which is also a good thing because that also helps to our disaster recovery conversation. One building gets flooded, you're not screwed in that region. You still have opportunities to do a bunch of other things. So you'll have more buildings, you'll build more stuff, and we'll figure out how to put what to put where, but that's, that's sort of how interconnection market needs to go. I think you owe him a commission. That was a great, <laughs> was a great commercial. <laughs> I think I'm going to go over there to get a <laughs> he, He's the tech guy. The All right. <laughs> Respecting the hierarchy. <laughs> right. Yeah, all right. I'll just try the 3.0 version then. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no Microsoft jokes. No. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it probably won't work the first time then. Uh, you know, the... <laughs> Every the, the thing I think the thing is you mentioned how um, you know a lot of data centers are going out and, and proliferating in the in the metros and every market is going to be different. Right? I think um, Gil is seeing that in his business where you know it might be different doing what he's trying to do on the east coast uh, of, of New Jersey or east coast of the U.S. versus what's happening say on the west coast of Africa. You know because the infrastructure is different, the market is different, dynamics are different. So the same is true. Uh, the same is true on, on how you're interconnecting and what you're building out, right? The physics are the same. It still takes cement as long as it takes to dry. Um, but, you know, your right-of-ways, you're building out infrastructure, your construction resources, all of these things vary from market to market, how people are getting to you, um, what they're doing there, what they're capable of. So, you know, I think we talked about this last year. If, if there was a one model fits all, then we'd already be drinking Bellinis at this point. <laughs> um, but there isn't. So I guess that's a good thing for all of us because it's going to keep us busy for, for years to come.
I agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll take a little bit uh, on the other side in terms of, you know, we're just scratching the surface in terms of what we're seeing for on the wireless infrastructure, and that's a lot of what we're dealing with at our company. You know, the densification projects that are going on, CRAN 5G, the amount of fiber that is being built or about to be built over the next, call it 24 months, um, is like nothing we will ever see, or have seen, I should say, not that we won't see, we haven't seen. Um, because it's the amount of fiber that all of these wireless players are gonna be taking down in metros, and again, as they extend their footprint. Um, and which is gonna be great for all, everybody sitting at this table, because it means more bandwidth is coming down you know, the pipe and it needs to go somewhere, it needs to get distributed. So, you know, obviously we're gearing up on that on the first light side. Uh, we have the network infrastructure, you know, Richard touched on it. That was one of the reasons why we decided to go on a, a path of, uh, uh, of M&A was because, you, again, you needed that scalability, but you also need the engineering firepower. And as like Najam said earlier, you know, you can't look at this uh, payback as being 12, 24 months. You have to take it out and be a partner with some of these wireless folks. They are building out your infrastructure or helping you build it out. But um, I think Frank said this to me a year ago. I don't want to pay, I don't want to be your infrastructure um, bank, you know, where I'm paying for everything. You know, this has to be a partnership um, as you're doing some of these projects. So, you know, that's the way we look at it, but, you know, for everybody in this room, I think the exciting thing is what's coming down, again, the, the pipe here is, is large fiber deployments, lots of bandwidth, lots of opportunity for everybody in this room. I agree with you, Pat, and... Um, Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> We're all good. We're all good. Everything's uh, working out. <laughs> But, um, but thanks to Facebook, Microsoft, the rest of the OTTs, the world has changed forever. It's only been the last 15 years that we're addicted to these phones in our pocket, but more importantly, as we become an aging population, our cars will get us to places without us actually driving, which I'll really appreciate 20 years from now. Um, the Ubers of the world. The applications are endless. But at the end of the day, where do the apps sit? That's up to the smart guys to figure out how to do it cost effectively, and they need optionality. And to have that optionality to say where my app is going to sit, where it's going to reside, how I'm going to manage it, means that they've thought through the network architecture and all the diversity needed to do it. So those are the secrets that keep us all safe. Um, they need us in terms of infrastructure. You know, we're fortunate enough to be in a great location with great partners like Tata and Aquacoms because across the ocean in two different ways. Um, because at the end of the day, customers need to know how do things work. Let's make sure we design things that are going to last for the future. And let's make sure that the lights are always on, but more importantly, the internet's always working, because that's what we care about today. Absolutely. Well, I might turn it to the, uh, to the floor for a question or two. Uh, one in the back. Just a quick technical question regarding integrated optics. The router technology curve seems to be slower than the transport technology curve. Um, curious what you see in the market. Do you see a point where Technology optics will be just in the routers and uh, kind of forklift out the transport here. Just curious on your thoughts. A little bit of prognosticating there. Uh, I'll take that. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I think we've seen a, a move recently to people trying to integrate the, the long haul optics and the routers, but it's not actually that new, right? It's, it's an idea that I, I've seen Cisco trying to do for. 15, 20 years now, and it, it's failed every time, and I think there's a reason for that. Uh, optical technology develops at a vastly different rate than router technology, switch technology. And the problem, the penalty that you pay in interconnecting these two things is you've now, you've coupled them together in a way that is very difficult, right? You, you've made now a low density line card that isn't as reusable, isn't as scalable, isn't as cheap, and it probably came to the market 12 to 18 months slower than it should have if you had just been able to decouple the two. And the, the cost of interconnection of these guys is, is not that difficult, right? That's, that's what's driving uh, a lot of the, the QSP28 SR4 market today, right? The, you know, millions and millions of these units are shipping because for the, the cost of a $200 optic, you can replace the need to, to lock yourself into a dedicated piece of hardware that's not a good fit for your, for your network. Uh, for, for years to come. So I, I personally see no life in that. I think it's uh, a really bad design and, and something that's going to fail again. The, the only thing I'd add is uh, I agree with Raz on, on, on his points. In, 
in certain scenarios, like a data center inside the data center model, um, you have a ton more interconnects inside the data center than outside the data center. And if you want to go really high, uh, like 400 gigs, one of the options may be onboard optics. Um, and that's a, can we make this work in this time frame? I think it will eventually still come out of the box and be a pluggable again, uh, but initially might be an option to look at uh, onboard type stuff. So more of a technology reason for doing it, because uh, we need capacities faster, uh, than more of a business case. Any other questions? Um, you just touched on the ability to be nimble in the marketplace, and now we're living in basically a just-in-time uh, society where we want instant gratification. So it's how nimble we are, and that's where these interconnections come into play. So have you started to see any trends where those interconnections are faster, where you're not waiting five to ten days for a cross-connect to go through a process to get from one floor to another, or are you still starting to feel some? That's yours. <laughs> yeah, that's all yours. <laughs> so, so, you know, obviously there's a, a pain point in the speed of interconnection, right? Whether it's one day or five days, but it's more than that. It's, it's the pain point in the number of people that were needed to place that order in the first place, to run it through sales, to run it through provisioning, to get an LOA, to have it get a correct LOA, um, to, 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 you know, project manage the plugging in of the patch cable to the router. That's the thing that takes weeks or months uh, in, in most cases, right? So any any large company has hundreds or thousands of people that are project managing this this type of stuff. That's what's slowing down the evolution of, of the, the real just-in-time stuff. So there's there's nothing a data center can do. If, if, if they made the cross-connect happen in six hours instead of 12 or 24, that doesn't really change things, right? What changes things is the, the business drivers around that. The, how do you get the order placed and get it provisioned and get it configured and get it out there, that's where you need to look to the model that, that's worked great in the cloud space, which is real infrastructure around automation, around treating it treating it like a, it, it's gotta all be done in software, it's gotta all be, be, be orchestrated, it's gotta be measured, it's gotta be, uh, you, you really have to think about it in that kind of scale and then you open up a whole different kind of business, right? You open up people who are able to, to reconfigure networks in very different ways. They're able to, uh, to really move stuff into the cloud in much more pervasive ways than they were before because of the, the six-month process to get a, a one interconnection for one thing through one carrier. Uh, that's, that's the real value. I'd like to add, but one of the things that we did is since we don't charge recurring fees across connects, we said, connect to everybody. When you come in, order 48 and connect to everybody. You're all set, congratulations. You don't call me at this point, just go ahead and light up your circuits and do what you have to do. Get your NNIs rolling. So by getting rid of the cost, in essence, now you can just connect everyone at the same time when you first walk in. It's like obviating the value of interconnection in some ways and bringing it back to this is the location where you ought to be. Right. So I think there will be some battles along those, those approaches. Um, and. Uh, I've learned something from Richard today, which is stack the audience with people who are going to lob you some easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. Thank you. I just wanted to ask in terms of content, just to hear a little bit from a demand perspective. How can we cross the, the, the point which is about the consumerization of, of the network? And I'm talking from a demand perspective. Is it really just about high definition video being consumed, download, and you know, uploaded AR and VR? How do you see actually driving it? far more than enterprise or cloud, actually driving that uh, uh, infrastructure deployment and fiber only got to be from I can give you a sort of a specific answer, but there's a generic answer as well. Um, we, we always sort of every year we do these five-year projections what our growth is going to be and we look at these this five-year chart saying whoa hang on boom okay first two three years is fine this level of growth the last two years it can't be that big and we'll just cut it down and we'll bring it down artificially because we don't know any better we've been wrong every time every time it's higher than what we thought so yeah, traffic is growing. The, the trouble is that, um, and I think I've said that, I guess I'm using this sort of example again. <laughs> um, there, there's a, so much compute in this thing in your hand, and then there's an army of developers out there writing code, coming up with ideas to use this compute that you have in your hand. Guess what? Traffic's not going down. 
<laughs> and, and that's been my experience. Every time we've done projections, we've been wrong. Um, you can come up with different scenarios of what it takes to do. Our patterns are changing for sure. Uh, we used to do a lot of messaging. We did a, started doing a lot of photos. And then we started now a lot of videos. Um, we're starting to do a lot of 360 videos now. We're starting to see that. Uh, a lot of VR is going to happen. So experiences are going to change over time and things are going to move. But one thing that's been constant that the growth has been faster than anybody has projected. Now, you do have to uh, then split the, the uh, growth in two ways, at least the way we think about this is. One is uh, machine to user traffic, uh, which is, grows at a different pace, because uh, that's about the user and where they are and what type of services they can consume, what device they have in their hands, and things like that. Um, so it's a very different sort of growth curve, and we worry a lot, lot about projecting that side model. The other one is the, the more difficult one, which is machine to machine traffic. And machine-to-machine -machine traffic is, a, is several times uh, so, uh, more than machine-to-user traffic. Uh, and Frank would tell you the same, Google will tell you the same. Machine-to-machine -machine traffic tends to be a lot more. Uh, and it's more unpredictable, because we at the same time, we have you know, hundreds of thousands of compute machines behind it, and lots of software developers coming up with new things to do uh, that they want to do, and they just unpredictably add more traffic to it. So traffic just grows on that side as well. Plus those pesky machines never seem to go to sleep. They're just always working and always buzzing away, you know? I'm just asking, are we, are we at the moment in, in the consumer-driven space? And there seems to be an awful lot about generation, big consumption of video and generation of video. Before we get into the machine-to-machine -machine world, which looks to me like it's two or three years down the line before that is really going to start to actually try to be transported. I don't, I don't, I don't no. know if you can say that no. per se, eh? <laughs> no. No, it's happening. I mean, if you think about simple use cases, all right, too much information conversation going to happen. Um, you know, you go to a, get a massage. You used to go find a place. Now there's an app. <laughs> They'll match you to a masseuse near you, right? So people will keep coming up with new, new ways to solve problems because you do have compute on both ends, the server side and your, your CPE side, right? And, and you've got to build a network to connect the two together. So my apps usually just tell me where to go get pizza, but... <laughs> Not a massage? I said I too, much, too all, much information. All the, you know, whatever floats your boat. You no, but if you look at the number of companies and enterprises out there that still haven't transitioned to the cloud, you know, they're going to move to the cloud and they're going to do what they're doing today, but when they get to the cloud and they move their workloads around, then they're going to start to figure out how they also evolve and innovate their own business, which is then going to change the dynamics again. All right, so, you know, we're just at the beginning Right, of, of where we stand. How that translates into traffic, I mean, yeah, if, if we could answer that, then we would we probably, we would already be drinking Bellinis mm -hmm. right now with Gil at his club, so. Uh. So one, one thing I would add to that is, you know, there's still whole industries that are built around mailing hard drives today because they're not able to get the connectivity that they want, when they want it, how they want it. There's still a ton of, of room for growth in that space. And when you talk about things like self-driving cars, now you've got to start thinking about massive amounts of telemetry between massive amounts of, of devices that are out there that need to talk to each other. So that machine-to-machine -machine traffic is entirely the, the growth. That's, there's more machines than there are humans, and, and that's really what's driving the, the bandwidth needs. Yeah, no, I'd we'll be building uh, more machines. <laughs> and I was going to actually just uh, um, piggyback on that last comment and say that we're, we're also going to see some of the same machines doing much more uh, and actually communicating much more as well as so many, many more devices. Uh, obviously, Cars was featured here today, but uh, uh, all kinds of other devices that are going to start to actually uh, communicate as well. Um, and I think that's just the beginning of all kinds of commercial applications and, and the like. So we are, in many ways, in a, uh, a technology-driven as well as a, uh, uh, a, a behavioral uh, modification uh, dynamic that is all seemingly compounding uh, the proliferation of uh, network utilization. Uh, so with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. I have to admit, I did not think we would actually be able to cover the global networking and communications infrastructure and to the depth of pizza and massages, but uh, <laughs> I think we covered a lot of ground today, and uh, I appreciate everyone's attention. And see you all next year. <laughs>